Hello, students. Uh, we are now on to the section, uh, second section of the chapter, Methods of Point Estimation. So assume again that x1 to xn is an IID sample from some distribution. Uh, the expected value of x1 to the power k, and we're doing x1 just because uh, you're always guaranteed to have x1. It's just It's just conventional to do that it doesn't really matter you could choose xn to the power k if you wanted to it's iid so it doesn't matter uh the but the expected value of x1 to the power k is called the kth population moment so uh, um just to give you some further context uh the expected value of x1 that's x1 to the power of one uh, so that's going to be the first moment, which, by the way, is equal to mu. Uh, the expected value of x2, uh, of x1 to the power 2, that's the second moment. And that is equal to sigma squared plus mu squared, uh, if you have a variance. So the second moment is seen as relating to spread and relating to uh, the... Uh, variance of your data whereas the first moment is seen as relating to the mean of your data and you can go to the third moment that's the expected value of x1 to the power of three and so on okay these are the population moments and one over n times the sum from i equals one to n xi to the power k is called the kth sample moment so you do something like square your data and then take the mean of the squared data. That would be the second sample moment. The mean, the sample mean is the first uh, sample moment. Uh, so, uh, so a sample moment is an unbiased estimator for the corresponding population moment. And the idea is we can get unbiased estimators for moments so perhaps if we're using those estimators, we could then use unbiased estimators for moments to obtain unbiased estimators for uh, other, uh, other characteristics of the population. And this allows us, um, this, this basically is the basis of what's known as method of moments estimation. So we have a distribution, and that distribution has parameters theta 1 to theta k. Uh, we want to estimate those parameters. We are going to do so using the method of moments estimation procedure as follows. First, compute the first uh, k population moments. So if you have k parameters you want to estimate, estimate k moments uh, in terms of the unknown parameters theta 1 to theta k. Uh, I will note that... Uh, maybe there's a situation where uh, the mean of the distribution in question is like always zero or something like that. So maybe instead of estimating the first moment, you would ask, you would, or, or maybe instead of working with the first moment, you would work with the second moment only because maybe the uh, distribution in question only differs in terms of spread rather than location, whatever. But uh, you could do something like that. Uh, but anyway. So use those moments and uh, compute the moments in terms of the parameters. Solve for the parameters so that they are in terms of the moments. And then replace the population moments with the sample moments to get expressions for the method of moments estimators, which we're calling theta hat 1 to theta hat k. So what, what's nice about method of moments estimation it's fairly intuitive. Uh, it's pretty easy to describe, for instance, uh, what the distribution of the statistic is going to be because it's based on sample means. And that means that we get to use the central limit theorem in all sorts of places. Uh, there's no guarantee that the estimators are unbiased. And they're probably not minimum variance estimators either. But... Uh, they are probably consistent estimators, and they're often pretty robust estimators. In fact, they're estimators that, assuming that your data has that many moments, they're always going to work. Uh, they're they're uh, always going to uh, estimate what they're going to try to estimate. So they're pretty robust, and that actually all they really require that you assume 
is that your population have that many moments in order for those estimators to work. And that's pretty nice. It's nice that all we have to do is just assume that we have those moments because that's um, generally a weak assumption. Uh, it, all it takes for a random variable, or a, a, for, all it takes for a variable, a random variable to have um, an infinite number of moments is that the phenomena in question be bounded. Meaning that there is some maximum value that the probability of exceeding that mass maximum value is zero. Um, so if you have that, oh, and also uh, a minimum value too. Like it can't go get too small either. Uh, but if you have that property, then you have an infinite number of moments and all your moment conditions are satisfied. Uh, so it, they're pretty robust. All right. Uh, what is the method of moments estimator for the population variance? Well, uh, the population variance, according to our shortcut formula, that's another nice thing about the shortcut formulas. They're very nicely phrased in terms of moments. Uh, this is going to equal the expected value of x1 squared uh, minus the mean of x1 squared, which is equal to uh, m2, the second population moment, minus the first population moment squared. All right, then. So if we want to get the method moment, uh, if we want to get the MME, the method moments estimator, for the uh, variance, that's going to be sigma hat squared, which is uh, M2, capital M2, minus M1 squared, where as a reminder of what M2 and M1, or capital M2 and capital M1 are, that's 1 over N times the sum from I equals 1 to N X I squared uh, minus uh, the sample mean squared, which for what it's worth, it's 1 over N times the sum from i equals 1 to n uh, xi. And actually, that corresponds exactly to uh, the estimator we were studying in the previous video. So we know for a fact uh, that, well, OK, if we wanted to um, write this differently, we could say this is 1 over n times the sum from i equals 1 to n uh, xi minus x bar squared. So this is basically the estimator we were considering in the previous video. And we know for a fact that this estimator is biased, but it is also consistent. Uh, the bias is generally pretty small. All right, uh, next example. What is the MME for the rate parameter lambda, which is equal to one over mu for an exp exponential distribution? So mu, of course, is exactly the first moment. So that means that lambda which is equal to one over mu is one over m1. And therefore the MME is lambda hat, which is one over capital M1. Remember that capital M1 is something computed from a sample. And this is one over X bar, which is also another statistic that we considered last time. And we know that one over X bar is a biased estimator for lambda, but the bias is pretty small and it's pretty easy to fix. Uh, example 12, let x1 to xn by, be an IID sample from uh, the distribution that, f from a uniform distribution uh, with parameters a minus b and a plus b. So this is a distribution in terms of a location parameter a and a scale parameter b. So um, a corresponds to a location parameter and B is corresponding to a scale parameter, as opposed to a maximum and minimum value of the uh, uniform distribution. What are the MMEs for A and B? All right, so let me get caught up in my notes. Uh, let's compute first the first moment. So the, uh, let's zoom in. All right, 
So the uh, expected value of x1 is equal to uh, the midpoint, which is a minus b plus a plus b divided by 2. The b's cancel. You get 2a over 2, which is equal to a. So not shockingly, uh, our location parameter is the expected value of these random variables. Uh, the expected value of x1 squared is going to be um, uh, uh, it's going to be the variance of x1 uh, plus uh, the expected value of x1 squared. So maybe we should uh, compute the variance. Uh, first and, and the reason why is because we already have a formula for doing that so uh, since we have a formula on hand for computing the variance we should probably take advantage of it so uh, the variance of x1 is going to be 1 over 12 of uh, a plus b minus a uh, plus b squared uh, the a's cancel so you're going to get uh, 1 over 12 times 2b squared, which is equal to b squared over 3. All right. So that's the variance. And we've already computed the expected value of x1. So that means that this quantity is equal to b squared over 3 plus a squared. So this... As a reminder, this a is exactly equal to m1, and b squared over 3 plus a squared is equal to m2. To obtain method moments estimators, we need to write a and b in terms of m1 and m2. So we will write, uh, we, we have the following system of equations. a is equal to m1, and b squared over 3 plus a squared is equal to m2. All right, so what does this imply? Um, well, we have automatically that m1 squared, uh, no, 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 uh, m1 is equal to a. All right, uh, no, wait, wait, okay, so the top is just done. We, we don't have to do anything with that top equation because it's already about as simple as it's going to get. Uh, so we only need to screw around with the equation below. And we'll have b squared over 3. Uh, that's going to be plus m1 squared. This is equal to m2. All right. So this is going to be b squared over 3. Uh, that's equal to m2 minus m1 squared. That should look familiar to you. Uh, that's basically the population variance. So that's going to imply furthermore that uh, b squared is equal to 3 times m2 minus m1 squared. And it then follows from this that we have a equals m1 and b is equal to the square root of 3 times uh, m2 minus m1 squared to the power of 1 half. Uh, so uh, uh, let's see. Um, I, when you take a square root like that, when it comes to B, you probably should do the plus or minus business. But the thing is, I know that B is going to be positive, basically because I said so. Uh, in that setup, A minus B, A plus B, it is assumed, I probably, I, excuse me, I probably should just write this down. It is assumed that B is greater than zero. Otherwise, that formula doesn't make any sense. So uh, we don't have to check for like plus or minus stuff because we just know that b is greater than zero so we automatically default to plus all right so then if we want to get the mme estimators or 
MMEs, sorry, that means that a hat is going to be uh, the, the first sample moment, which is x bar, and uh, b hat, uh, b hat is going to be the square root of 3 times m2 minus m1 square to the power of 1 half. Uh, hopefully you recognized this from before that this is sigma hat squared that we computed before. So this is going to be uh, the square root of 3 sigma hat. All right. Uh, yeah, so you just uh, scale the standard, devi the, the standard deviation or your standard deviation estimator by the square root of 3 and uh, you got, you're good. You got b hat. All right. Uh, next example, consider a shifted exponential distribution that depends on two parameters mu and gamma such that x1 minus gamma is equal to the expect is is following an exponential distribution with parameter mu as you've usually thought of the exponential distribution. But if I were to plot what the PDF of this distribution uh, looks like, here is gamma. And uh, it's basically just a shifted exponential distribution. Uh, so its mean is going to be at gamma, pl well, gamma plus mu, which means that mu should no longer be interpreted in this situation as being the mean parameter for this random variable. Okay, so uh, what are the MMEs for mu and gamma? Well, uh, the expected value of x1 minus gamma is equal to mu because we know that it follows a, an exponential distribution with parameter mu and that's going to imply that the expected value of x1 which is the first moment is equal to uh, mu plus gamma which is equal to m1 and the variance of x1 minus gamma is equal to the variance of x1 which is equal to mu squared which implies that the second moment of this random variable is going to be mu squared plus mu plus gamma uh, which is equal to m2. All right now we set up our system of equations we say uh, that m1 is equal to mu plus gamma and m2 is equal to mu squared plus mu plus gamma, which for what it's worth is equal to mu squared plus m1. Uh, okay. Uh... I think that's a mistake. Uh, sorry, I think I made ha I, yeah, I made a mistake here. So this should be uh, mu plus gamma squared. So this should be m1 squared. I had a suspicion that something was wrong. Okay, so let's start playing with these equations. Uh, let's leave the first equation alone, and we'll say then that uh, mu squared is equal to uh, m2 minus m1 squared. Okay, and that's found by basically taking uh, this expression and solving it for mu squared. And then we uh, can take the square root Uh, in our next statement and say that uh, uh, and say oh good grief stop it stop it all right okay uh, this is going to be when we take the square root of that bottom equation mu equals the square root 
of m2 minus m1 squared. And again, we're not going to bother with the plus or minus business because we know that whatever estimator we have for mu is going to, or whatever estimator we have for mu should be positive because mu is a positive parameter basically by uh, design. So we, we just get to say that. All right, uh, next up. So, um, or actually not estimator. It's just, it's just the case that mu is greater than zero. So uh, we just are gonna use the positive part. All right, so the bottom equation is done. Now let's play with the top equation. Uh, we get to say now that M1 is equal to gamma plus the square root of M2 minus M1 squared. All right. Uh, and then we get to, oh, did I write plus that? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's true. That's true. So nothing's wrong. Um, all right, continue writing stuff down. We will then change the top equation to say after we solve for gamma that uh, gamma is equal to m1 minus uh, the square root of m2 minus m1 squared. Oh, and that's it. Yeah, so we're done. Uh, so that's our so that's gamma in terms of m1 and m2, and we have mu also in terms of m1 and m2. So mu is m2 minus m1 squared, and gamma is m1 minus that. Therefore, our method of moments estimators are going to be uh, gamma hat, which is going to be uh, m1 minus the square root of m2 minus m1 squared, which is going to be uh, the sample mean minus sigma hat as computed above. Keep using that estimator. And then uh, uh, mu hat is just going to be uh, sigma hat. And that's kind of funny. It's kind of funny to look at this. Uh, remember before that uh, for just a plain exponential distribution, uh, the estimator for mu was going to be uh, the, uh, the sample mean. And now we're using the sample standard deviation, which if you're familiar with the exponential distribution, uh, you know that uh, the, uh, the uh, mean parameter mu it's the mean, but it is also the standard deviation of the distribution. And it's just kind of funny how I mean, we already had a situation where we could have used either the sample mean or the sample standard deviation as estimators for mu. And I argued that the estimator that you should use in the case of just the plain old exponential distribution is the uh, sample mean. That's probably what you should use. That's the best estimator. The moment we, and, and also if we were just working with the exponential distribution, we would have said, okay, M1 is equal to, <coughs> excuse me, uh, M1 is equal to mu. So that means that your estimator is going to be X bar. And then once we add in this shift parameter, now we get a different story. Uh, the story we get instead is you should estimate mu using the standard deviation, which you know is an estimator that's uh, invariant with respect to shift. Uh, so it doesn't care about any sort of shift. So it means that if you do have, if you're in the presence of shift, the better estimator is going to be, well, or the estimator that you're going to use is going to be the standard deviation. By, by the way, none of this is actually talking about efficiency because if we were to, well, we're going to talk about maximum likelihood estimators in a second, and the maximum likelihood estimators are, would have a different story on how you should estimate mu and gamma. Uh, they probably would use the sample mean um, plus the, uh, I actually don't know off the top of my head what it, what the, uh, uh, what the maximum likelihood estimators would 
say for these estimators, I could probably guess that gamma hat would be the sample media, uh, uh, the sample minimum, uh, and uh, mu hat might be the mean of the data minus the sample minimum, something like that. So anyway, uh, it's just kind of interesting to see how these estimators change when you switch and add in that shift component. Uh, so it's just kind of funny. All right. Uh, moving on, that is what I want to say about method moments estimators. Uh, so the next estimation principle that we're going to talk about is maximum likelihood estimator, uh, la maximum likelihood estimation. And here, I'm going to give a uh, a small example to demonstrate the idea behind maximum likelihood estimation. We're going to flip a coin, and we're going to record whether I get hats or not. Um, or we can think of this as being a Bernoulli random variable, but Bernoulli random variables are very similar to uh, uh, coin flips. The coin could be a fair coin or it could be a biased coin. And if the coin is biased, the probability of getting hands is going to be P equals 0.9. When I flip the coin and observe an outcome, how will I decide which coin was flipped? So there's two possible coins in this scenario. And we need to decide which coin was flipped so or if you like estimate the coin that was flipped okay how are we going to do that uh let's compute uh the probability mass functions for a bernoulli random variable uh we only have to worry about it at p0 and p1 and let's see what the probability mass function is for the case of coin one and the case of coin two all right, if it's coin one that was flipped, then P0 will be 0.5 and P1 will be 0.5. If coin two was what was flipped, then P0 is 0 0.1 and P1 is 0.9. Okay, so what should we do to decide uh, which coin was flipped? Suppose that we get, so X is a random variable that is tracking uh, the uh, uh, the uh, heads or tails, and it's going to be one if it got heads or not. Uh, it's going to be one if it got heads. So um, let's look at this. Um, if we get heads equals one, the probability, or I, I, I'm not really sure how, how I should write that. Um, all right. Sorry, I'm just thinking about how to explain this. Uh, although I, I suppose I do have text, which then begs the question, why do you have notes if you need to think about how to explain it? Well, reasons. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, if we've got... Let, let, let's suppose that the coin comes up heads. Uh, if coin one was the actual coin that was flipped, the probability of getting that was 0.5. But if coin two was what was actually flipped, the probability was 0.9. Now, if you got tails, tails is extremely likely under coin two, but fairly likely under coin one. So, um, I hope I didn't say extremely likely. I meant extremely unlikely if I said that. So, if we were to adopt the maximum likelihood posi uh, position, we should pick the coin that maximizes the probability of whatever outcome we actually saw. Uh, what that means is that we can actually come up with a decision table. Uh, so x equals either zero or one. And if so x is gonna be either zero or one, and then our uh, guess will be the following according to the maximum likelihood principle. The maximum likelihood principle says, choose the coin, or what it, what it says in this context is, choose the coin that maximizes the likelihood of what, of what you saw. So if we saw zero, then we should pick coin one, since if we're looking at the probability mass function at zero, uh, zero was most likely if coin one was what we actually uh, flipped as opposed to coin two. So 
we should uh, pick coin one. So this will be coin one. If we flipped and got heads, then we should decide that coin two is the more likely one because, um, well, basically, uh, an outcome of heads was most likely uh, under the scenario that coin two was the coin that was flipped. So we should use coin two. And that's, the and that's what the maximum likelihood principle would tell us to do. Maximize the after the fact probability of the data that you saw or the a posteriori uh, outcome. So that's what we would do. Um, all right, so that suggests what are known as maximum likelihood of estimators. And we start out with what we had here was a likelihood function. And this, uh, we think of the likelihood function as um, depending on the uh, type of coin. Uh, so we are going to need uh, what's known as a likelihood function. And we're, I'm going to use uh, the letter F to denote either a probability mass function or a probability density function. You, you use either one of those, depending on whether your data is discrete or continuous. So we have some parameters theta 1 to theta k that we want to estimate. So, so the likelihood function of theta 1 to theta k, this is precisely the joint probability mass function or probability density function of the data that you saw. Um, so x1 to xn are observed values of the uh, of, of the data set. So uh, you plug in what you actually observed for your random variables and the this likelihood function is viewed as depending on theta 1 to theta k. Uh, when the random variables are iid, then you know automatically what the likelihood function is going to be. Uh, the likelihood function for theta 1 to theta k This is going to be the product from i equals 1 to n, uh, the marginal PDF of uh, x1, but evaluated at each of these xi, uh, evaluated at the numbers theta 1 to uh, theta k, or those are the parameters. The maximum likelihood estimators or the MLEs, theta hat 1 to theta hat k, are the values that maximize the likelihood function. So in other words, make this number as large as possible. They are interpreted as the most likely values of the parameter given the data we saw, in that we, would most likely, we were most likely to see the values of the data if those were the parameters. So maximize your likelihood, make it as large as possible. And that will be the, and whatever estimators do this will be the maximum likelihood estimators. Now, generally, you don't want to maximize this expression directly because it's a product of functions. And if you're maximizing stuff, you're going to be taking derivatives. And the derivative of a gigantic product like that is going to make you want to cry. <laughs> So you don't actually maximize that most of the time. I mean, sometimes you do, but most of the time you don't. Instead, we will at, uh, maximize uh, L theta 1 to theta k. Here I wrote uh, lowercase l. And this is going to be the natural log of L of theta 1 to theta k. So you take the natural log of the likelihood function. What's the natural log going to be? Well, it's going to be the sum from i equals 
uh, 1 to n ln of f of xi. So from theta 1 to uh, good grief, stupid screen. From theta 1 to theta k. All right. Uh, there's a few parentheses there. So work with the natural log of that of the probability mass or probability density function for the distribution. Add that up and then choose the parameter values that that would maximize that sum. You're allowed to do this because since ln of x is an increasing function, uh, both capital L and lowercase l are going to have the same uh, are going to have their maximum at the same location. Now, by the way, uh, before I go on, notice that uh, notice that uh, I've written down stuff that's in terms of multiple parameters. So you're actually talking about maximizing a multivariate function. So what that means is if you're not comfortable with how to maximize multivariate functions or how to take derivatives of multivariate functions, that one video that I recorded on multivariate calculus may be of interest to you. So you may want to go watch that to see how to uh, work with derivatives of uh, multivariate functions. All right. Uh, so maybe take a second to stop this video, go watch that other one, watch the part on multivariate calculus if you haven't already seen it, and then come back. All right, uh, consider an IID data set of Bernoulli data. What is the maximum likelihood estimator of the sample proportion P? All right, um, we have this situation. Uh, X can be either the number zero or one, in which case we can write the probability mass function as follows. And I'm using f as the probability mass function. It's going to be p to the power x times 1 minus p to the power 1 minus x. And you can confirm for yourself that this in fact agrees with however I have written down the probability mass function for the Bernoulli distribution uh, in the past. Oh, there are some noisy magpies. Cute birds. I like magpies. But... I'm tired of their crap right now because I'm trying to record. All right, so what is going to be the likelihood function for this uh, data? Um, so the likelihood function depends on P. It's going to be uh, the joint probability mass function for X1 to Xn uh, for that parameter choice P which is going to be the product from i equals 1 to n uh, f of uh, xi for that parameter value p. And that is going to be uh, the product from i equals 1 to n uh, p to the power xi times 1 minus p to the power uh, 1 minus xi. And if we were to actually multiply this out, uh, what, what that product turns into is uh, the product of the sum from i equals 1 to n xi times 1 minus p times uh, the sum from i equals 1 to n, uh, 1 minus xi. And I'm already getting rather irritated with that notation. So uh, just because of how painful it is to write down. So I'm going to uh, simplify this and say that this is p to the power n times x bar. And then that's multiplied with uh, 1 minus p to the power n times 1 minus x bar. 
Actually, X bar is the sample proportion. If you want it, I could uh, write down. Uh, well, I'll, I'll just leave it like that. I'm going to leave it like that for now. Uh, all right, then. Uh, but I, I recommend that you should uh, actually work with the log likelihood. So the log likelihood, L of P, lowercase L of P, that's the natural log of L of P. And what is the natural log of this? Uh, it's going to be the natural log of P to the power NX bar. And that's being multiplied with 1 minus P to the power N minus X bar. So this will be plus LN 1 minus P to the power N times 1 minus X bar. And we can also uh, take those powers and move them out because that's how natural logs work. So this will be uh, equal to uh, nx bar ln of p plus n times 1 minus x bar ln 1 minus p. All right. Uh, now we need to take the derivative of this in terms of p. I'm going to say that uh, we're probably going to run out of room, so I need to be a little bit more careful with how I use space. Uh, the implication of this is that L prime, and I'm going to compute this at p hat because in the end we're going to end up with an estimator. Uh, it's going to be uh, nx bar divided by p hat um, uh, minus uh, n times 1 minus x bar over uh, 1 minus p hat. And if we're taking a maximum, this is going to equal 0. So this all equals 0. All right, then. Uh, so uh, we do some algebra. And we get that. Oops. Uh, and according to that algebra, uh, we get. Uh, uh, we're going to get basically after we do that algebra. I'm going to skip some of that. Some of those steps. That nx bar minus np hat is equal to zero, which then means that our uh, estimator for p hat or estimator p hat is going to be x bar, which is the sample mean. Okay. Uh, now that said, this shows that p hat equals x bar is a critical point. What we should do is compute the second derivative um, in order to actually confirm that. Um, this function is maximized at uh, the p hat that is x bar um, that we obtained earlier. So the second derivative is going to be uh, n x bar minus uh, no divided by p square uh, p hat squared uh, minus so it's negative that uh, minus n times 1 minus x bar uh, divided by uh, 1 minus p hat squared. Okay? And then if we were to plug in uh, our p hat, which is x bar, we, we get that the second derivative at the maximum likelihood estimator is going to be uh, negative n over x bar uh, which is x bar is going to be a number that's greater than zero minus n over one minus x bar, and that number is certainly going to be less than zero, except in like degenerate cases where x bar is either zero or one, in which case that's a rather difficult situation. But that is going to be a number less than zero, which means that the second derivative is less than zero. And you should recall from calculus when talking about optimization that 
in order for a maxima to be attained, um, if uh, assuming that uh, both the first and second derivative attain, uh, so you could have a situation where um, you have a critical point where the derivative is equal to zero, and the second derivative exists. The second derivative exists at that point. The second derivative needs to be less than zero in order for that point to actually be a maximum. Since that is the case, that confirms the fact that p hat, which is equal to x bar, is in fact um, is in fact the uh, value that maximizes the uh, the um the log likelihood function and therefore this is the maximum likelihood estimator so p hat equals x bar okay uh next example consider an iid data set drawn from an exponent exponential distribution with mean parameter mu find the mle for mu uh there's of course actually multiple estimators we could use for mu we've seen that before we could use uh, the sample mean, or we could use the sample standard deviation since both of those are going to estimate the same quantity. All right. Um, I am going to go ahead and just write down uh, the log likelihood function. Uh, so uh, the log likelihood in this uh, situation, so the log likelihood at mu is equal to uh, the sum from i equals 1 to n ln times the PDF, uh, ln of the PDF uh, xi when the parameter is mu. But let's go ahead and write down what the PDF is. And it is uh, e to the power negative xi uh divided by mu and you might be thinking what about the situation where well okay there was there was a restriction there was an additional restriction that said that xi needs to be uh non-negative some i think some kid is screwing around outside um you had this restriction that xi needs to be non-negative how's that being handled by this well basically we don't really need to worry about the situation where xi is less than zero we don't need to worry about that because the probability that that actually happens in a sample uh in our in our framework is zero so we don't need to worry about probably zero events and we only need to worry about the probability density function on the region where uh the random variable could actually happen with some non-zero probability all right, so we actually get, it, it does make our life a little bit simpler. It means we don't need to worry about um, xi less than zero. So we're guaranteed that xi is greater than or equal to zero since we're going to leave our discussion to that region. Okay, and uh, you should be able to figure out that these two things effectively cancel each other out since they're inverse functions. And this is going to be, uh, I'm going to replace mu with mu hat. Uh, this is going to be um, the sum, well, 1 over mu hat times the sum from uh, i equals 1 to n xi, uh, which for what it's worth is equal to nx bar over mu hat. And... Uh, 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 hold on. Uh, something. Uh, something doesn't seem. Oh, right, 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 right. I now know what's wrong. Okay, uh, I didn't write that down quite right. Uh, it's um, the the PDF wasn't written down completely correctly. Uh, it should be we have e there and then. Uh, one over mu hat my apologies so that's why things weren't quite working out um, so that means that um, when dealing with that natural log we shouldn't actually just cancel it out like that it's not that simple 
Um, all right, so this is going to be uh, the sum from i equals one to n, um, and uh, it'll be ln of one over mu hat uh, plus ln of e negative xi over mu hat. All of this is being summed up. <coughs> Now we get to say that those cancel out. And this is going to be um, uh, let's change the color. This is going to be um, uh, the sum from i equals 1 to n. We can account for the ln of 1 over mu hat by saying that that's negative ln of mu hat. Uh, and then um, minus xi over mu hat. And this is going to be, uh, this is going to be this, so negative n times the sum, no, negative n times ln of mu hat. So n ln of uh, mu hat. Uh, minus effectively nx bar over mu hat. All right, and now take the derivative. So L prime of mu hat is equal to uh, negative n over mu hat uh, minus, well, actually it's going to be plus uh, nx bar over mu hat squared and this needs to equal zero in order for us to to attain a maximum and what we could do is add um n over mu hat to both sides and then raise both sides to the power negative one so that things are in kind of the right position so, so far, oh, and additionally, uh, we could divide out everything by n because it's basically superfluous. So we've now got, um, uh, we've got, um, well, that might not be, that might not be the best way to do it, but we're going to, we're going to find out. So we've now got mu hat is equal to uh mu hat squared over x bar all right so we'll what we'll do now is cancel out a mu hat on either side and then multiply both sides by x bar to get that the maximum likelihood estimator for mu hat is equal to the sample mean x bar all right uh, so then, what do we do now? Uh, we are going to confirm that this is in fact a maximum by taking a second derivative. Um, so the second derivative of our log likelihood function is equal to uh, n squared, no, n over mu squared, sorry. n over mu squared, uh, uh, minus uh, 2n or is that actually what it is? Yeah. So n over mu squared minus uh, 2n x bar over mu cubed. And then let's plug in our max our maximum likelihood estimator. So the second derivative at x bar is equal to uh, n over x bar squared. Um, oh, this should be mu cubed and there should not be a hat on it just to keep notation consistent. All right, so it'll be n over x bar minus uh, 2n x bar over x bar cubed, but one of those x bars cancels. So that actually goes away and we'll have x bar squared in the denominator 
in which case these two fractions has a common denominator. So this will be negative n over x bar squared, which is less than zero, which is what you want to have if this is in fact a maximum likelihood estimator. All right, so that resolves uh, that one. We've now gotten the maximum likelihood estimator for uh, mu. All right, uh, next example. Uh, consider an IID data set dr uh, drawn from a normal distribution with parameters uh, mu and sigma squared rather than sigma. This is one of those situations where parameterizing by the normal distribution in terms of its variance rather than its standard deviation is more advantageous since it's much easier to get the MLE for the uh, variance than it is to get it for, well, it's actually pretty easy to get it for the standard deviation too, but not in the way we're about to do it. Um, it's easier when you're invoking a theorem, <laughs> basically. So, uh, yeah, we're just going to uh, work on this for a second. We're treating basically sigma squared as a unit. So if you want, you could call this tau if you wanted to. But we need to treat that as a unit. All right, I'm going to go ahead and write down right away the log likelihood function. So uh, let's compute the the natural log of the PDF of a normal distribution. So recall that the normal distribu distribution we have two pi uh, sigma squared uh, to the power negative one half times exp of, uh, so we're using exp instead of e to the power of, just because it's easier to work with. So we'll have xi minus mu squared divided by two sigma squared. And that is going to, we're taking the, the log of all of that. And when we take the log of all of that, this is going to be negative one half and then we've got uh ln of uh two pi sigma squared plus stuff but before i go on with that other stuff i actually want to play around with this a little bit more and say that this is going to be negative one half um actually this is not all going to fit on this line so we'll just go straight to the next line so this will be negative uh, one half ln of sigma squared. And we're gonna leave sigma squared as sigma squared. We're maximizing with respect to sigma squared, not sigma. Um, so negative one half ln of sigma squared uh, minus ln of two pi. I just wanna treat that, I wanna treat that as a separate thing because I wanna treat it as a constant. I know when I take a derivative, I'm going to not care about what value it is. And then plus ln of exp of negative xi minus mu squared over two sigma squared. But I know that ln and exp, those are inverse functions. So we can effectively eliminate this uh, stuff and just write instead, uh, remove that, write instead minus, uh, minus xi minus mu squared over to sigma squared. All right, so what that suggests about the, uh, the uh, log likelihood function in terms of mu and sigma squared is that it's going to be the sum from i equals one to n ln of f xi in terms of mu and sigma squared. All right, but we know what that is. That's what we were computing up above. So this is going to be the sum of negative uh, one half uh, ln of sigma squared uh, minus uh, xi minus mu squared over two sigma squared. Uh, and then I'm just gonna say plus a constant. I'm going to treat this part right here as a constant. 
or I'm just going to treat it as a constant because it doesn't depend at all on uh, on the parameters. All right. So uh, what is this going to uh, equal? Well, this is going to equal uh, this part right here is a constant that gets added up n times. So you'll have negative uh, n uh, uh, negative n over 2 ln of sigma squared uh, minus uh, the sum from I well let's write instead uh, 1 over 1 over 2 sigma squared so minus 1 over 2 sigma squared and then we have the sum from I equals 1 to n x i minus mu squared all right now we need to take derivatives we're going to take partial derivatives I'm going to assume you know what a partial derivative is because I'm going to assume that if you didn't know it you watched my video on multivariate calculus and uh, where I talked about taking partial derivatives, effectively what you do is you treat one of the variables as actually being a variable and everything else as being, the, as being constant. All right, so to compute maximum likelihood estimators in this context, we're going to set the partial derivatives equal to zero. So um, the partial derivative of L with respect to uh, mu. Uh, is going to be um, and when you okay we're going to evaluate this thing at uh, mu hat uh, but whatever so uh, this part right here does not depend on mu so we just get to ignore it so we'll have uh, negative 1 over 2 sigma 2 sigma squared this is sigma squared uh, because the sigma squared doesn't depend on mu. And then we have the sum from i equals 1 to n, the partial derivative with respect to mu of xi minus mu and squared. So let's evaluate that. Uh, the 2 comes out. So this will become 2. Why is it not erasing? Probably because it's being stupid. Okay, so the two comes out, and that's how you handle that. Then the derivative of the inside is going to be uh, negative one. So you're going to end up with, in the end, this being uh, uh, xi minus mu. All right, so we're going to set this equal to zero to obtain the maximum likelihood estimator for mu. Oh, and also uh, these cancel out. And also, since we're saying that's equal to zero, we basically don't care about that um, either. Uh, we don't care about sigma squared anymore. Uh, so saying that's equal to zero, what we get to then say is that um, n times x bar, that's what the sum of xi is going to be, uh, minus n times mu hat is equal to zero. And all right then, that means that mu hat, oops, that, that's going to imply that uh, mu hat is equal to x bar. All right, now we need to work with um, uh, sigma squared. So partial L with respect to sigma squared. All right, what's that going to be? Uh, that's going to be negative n over 2 sigma squared uh, plus uh, 1 over 2 sigma squared squared. And then we have the sum from i equals 1 to n uh, xi minus mu squared. And we're going to set this equal to 0 in order to maximize it and also go ahead and uh, replace mu with its maximum likelihood estimator from above. All right. You are allowed to do that when you're trying to obtain ma maximum likelihood estimators. If you found an earlier maximum likelihood estimator, you can plug it in. Uh, so, uh, all right, uh, we have 
basically too many sigma squares. So one of those gets to cancel out by multiplying everything by sigma squared. Uh, and thus we get, uh, additionally, this it's slightly um, annoying to always be uh, uh, pulling this thing around everywhere. So uh, I'm probably going to deal with that in a second, right in terms of the sample variance. But then we're going to say uh, that, uh, oh, also the twos get to cancel out because we can multiply everything by two and get rid of those. So now we've got, oh, oh, well, we're almost done basically. We've got the sum from i equals one to n uh, xi minus x bar squared is equal to um, uh, multiply everything by sigma squared, you'll get n sigma squared, or let's say n sigma hat squared, uh, and then divide everything by n to get sigma hat squared by itself. And there we go. There's our maximum likelihood uh, estimator for sigma squared, one over n. It's kind of funny that uh, never once did we get the sample variance where we divide by n minus one. And all of these uh, uh, examples of finding any estimator. And the reason why is because neither MLEs or MMEs, which we talked about, are guaranteed to give you unbiased estimators. Generally, you have to unbias them yourself. Uh, if you want an unbiased estimator, you have to work harder to get one. All right? But... In any case, this is going to be the estimator. Uh, we also have the maximum likelihood estimator from mu hat too. Uh, that is given right here. All right, so we have both of our maximum likelihood estimators. Now, uh, what I did before in the previous examples, the more univariate examples was say, all right, we need to check that this is in fact a maximum. The thing is, that we would check for a maximum. So we check for a maximum by computing what's known as the Hessian matrix. So we need to compute an additional matrix if we want to actually check that this is uh, that this is actually a maximum. Um, and so show that the Hessian matrix is positive definite. Actually, I think it needs to be negative definite. No, yeah, it can't be positive definite. It needs to be negative definite. So uh, show that it is negative uh, definite. We're not going to do this. Because I've already done enough. I've already done, I've already gone outside of the pre far enough. I'm not going to go uh, computing the Hessian matrix. You can, since the, since this, uh, minimum and maximum was unique, you can pretty much trust that it's, uh, uh, the actual MLEs. All right. Uh, one final example. This one's kind of an interesting one. Considering an IID data set drawn from a uniform distribution with parameters zero and theta, find the MLE for theta. All right. This is one where you actually don't want to work with the log likelihood. Uh, the log likelihood is it's, you usually are working with it, but not always. And this is an example where the log likelihood is actually not uh, a useful way to try and maximize the likelihood function. All right, so here's what we're going to write down. We're going to say that f, um, so the PDF of our data, when it came from this distribution, Uh, now we want to consider it uh, as a piecewise function. This is going to be 1 over theta if um, 
zero is less than or equal to xi, uh, which is less than or equal to theta. So here's the reason why we need to be a bit more careful about the boundaries. So this is zero otherwise. I, before I said we don't really have to worry about uh, the fact that our PDF is a piecewise function before. And the reason why was because in the case of the exponential, uh, the par a parameter of interest did not show up in, uh, in determining what region the PDF was going to be positive. It didn't actually matter. It was basically, is this random variable greater than or equal to zero? So... You, you didn't have to worry about it, but in this situation, theta shows up in this uh, uh, in this uh, uh, definition of the piecewise function. So the parameter that you're trying to estimate shows up there, and that and because of that, you need to be more careful. The good news, though, is that in a way, it almost makes the job easier because when I then compute the likelihood function for theta. Uh, which is going to be the product from i equals 1 to n f of xi for theta. Uh, that's going to be, let's see, uh, we're going to have a zero otherwise at some point. So now let's think about when this thing would be positive. Uh, well, it's going to be positive when this is always satisfied. So this must always be satisfied. And it must be satisfied, that meaning for all i. Uh, for the likelihood to be, to be uh, positive. All right. So if that if any if at any point in time you have an xi that is greater than theta, that PDF will become zero, and then the whole thing will multiply to zero. So we must. So they must all be at less than or equal to theta. So we could say if that is the case, and they're all less than or equal to theta, then this will become one over theta to the power n because they're just going to multiply. Uh, 1 over theta n times in this uh, product. Uh, but this is only going to be true if... Um, uh, well, we're always going to have x i is greater than or equal to 0. Because that's something that doesn't depend on the parameter that we pick. But we'll also say and uh, x i is less than or equal to theta for all i. All right, so you need all of the xi's to be less than or equal to theta in order for this to be true. All right, we're going to say that ri is the ith order statistic. So that is, it's the, so remember before we were talking about the ordered data set, that means that r1 is less than or equal to R2, which is less than or equal to dot, 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 uh, which is less than or equal to Rn, which means that Rn is going to be the sample maximum. So this is a sample max. And there is a simple way to guarantee that all of the Xi are less than or equal to theta, and that is that um the sample that the maximum the sample maximum uh the sample maximum is going to be uh less than or equal to theta and if we if we wanted to we could say all right we could replace xi greater than or equal to zero with the sample minimum uh so if r1 is greater than or equal to zero and I should not write Ri. Sorry about that. Uh, the sample maximum is Rn. So we need Rn is less than or equal to theta. All right. Uh, the thing, though, is we actually don't really care 
uh, so much about this part. This is largely irrelevant because you're guaranteed that the minimum is going to be greater than or equal to zero. But the but whether the maximum is less than or equal to theta, that is not guaranteed since we are optimizing over theta. I actually want to write this as theta greater than or equal to Rn. Um, yeah. So it since theta is the thing we are trying to maximize and theta is viewed as being variable, it is not guaranteed that theta will always be greater than or equal to rn because we could pick a smaller theta than that and result in our likelihood function becoming zero. So how then are we going to maximize this? Well, remember from calculus one, when talking about maximization theory, that it's not always the case that a function is maximized when the derivative is zero, which is a good thing because we don't want to take derivatives of this since it's got a p, since we were going to, or, it, it would be a, well, I don't know, taking derivative is okay. But a function is not always maximized when the derivative is equal to zero. It's also maximized at points where the derivative doesn't exist. And one point where the derivative is, is not going to exist is when theta equals rn. So, so the derivative does, or L prime does not exist when uh, theta is equal to rn since that is a point where the function jumps because if we were to plot this function what would it look like um oops if we were to plot the likelihood function our plot would look like so we have um rn here the sample maximum remember that this function depends on theta so uh for uh, theta greater than or equal to rn, the function is going to be decreasing because it's going to be some. Well, actually, we should let's let's go ahead and put. No, uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and do that. So it's going to be a decreasing function for theta greater than or equal to rn since this is a um, one divided by theta to the power n. So as you increase theta, that number is going to get smaller and smaller. And for rn less than uh, for theta less than rn. This function is going to be zero. Okay, so we create a plot, and there is a jump in this in this function, and it's it's a point of non-differentiability. So another place where functions can attain their maxima are places where, uh, or local maxima, are places where the function is uh, non-differentiable, and we have a point of non-differentiability at the point theta equals rn and actually this plot uh, reveals to us that this is where the likelihood function gets maximized so so that means that uh, l uh, so that means that l of theta is going to be maximized when theta is equal to r sub n, so the sample maximum. Or let's write L theta hat is maximized when theta hat is equal to r sub n, which means that our maximum likelihood estimate for uh, this, uh, this parameter theta, which should be interpreted as the maximum of this distribution, our maximum likelihood estimator is the sample maximum, which, is, which seems to make absolutely perfect sense. Right. It's just that for this, you actually were not using really much calculus to attain uh, to obtain uh, the maximizer. All right, uh, MLEs are consistent estimators. You're you're just gonna have to take my word for that. They are consistent. Uh, they are either minimum variance or they're almost minimum variance, and that you could probably do a little bit more to them to get a minimum variance estimator. And uh, these properties improve as the sample size gets large. Additionally, if you have a function of your parameters um, and you want to find the MLE of the function of those parameters, the MLE will be the function applied to the MLEs. So as an example, uh, let's suppose we wanted to find the MLE of lambda, which is equal to one over mu. I want to find its MLE. I know that the MLE for mu 
is x bar. And that's going to imply that the MLE for lambda is 1 over x bar. Or let's go back to example 20 where we were uh, trying to find the MLE for mu and sigma squared instead of mu and sigma. It's easy to get an MLE for mu and sigma squared. And then once you do that, you can find the MLE for the standard deviation sigma because uh, the MLE for sigma squared was um, 1 over n times the sum from i equals 1 to n. So from i equals 1 to n, uh, xi minus x bar uh, squared. And what that implies is that the MLE for sigma is going to be the square root of that. So it's going to be the square root of 1 over n times the sum from i equals 1 to n xi minus x bar squared, which is kind of like the sample standard deviation. All right, so actually all of the estimators that we've seen are general cases of a gen are, are, are specific cases of to of a general approach to parameter estimation where a good estimate is an estimate that optimizes some objective function. Uh, so MLEs are maximizing the likelihood function. Uh, the so there's a class of functions uh, estimators called least squares estimators. Least squares estimators minimize the sum of squared errors where you have um, observations, xi, you have a predicted value of observations depending on parameter values, and you pick the parameter values to minimize the uh, square, the sum of square differences between your observations and their predicted values. Uh, uh, least squares estimation would show up in Math 3080 when talking about um, uh, when uh, talking about uh, linear regression, but at the same time, we've actually already seen a least squares estimator. Uh, the least squares estimator for mu, the sample mean, is the sample, uh, or, or mu, the population mean, is the sample mean. So we've already seen one least squares estimator. And there's also the least absolute deviation estimators, where uh, you have a predicted value that depends on parameters, but instead, oh, I guess I'm saving. Uh, instead of uh, uh, maximizing uh, or minimizing uh, the squared errors, you minimize the absolute value of the errors. Uh, you have M estimators, which are, um, oh, these, uh, yeah, these uh, maximize basically the sum of an objective function applied at each xi that depends on parameter values. Uh, and all of the estimators that we've seen so far are specific cases of M estimators. Uh, so, well, what was, uh, what was the point of discussing that? Well, we could talk about, for example, the sample median, which never at, which never at any point showed up as an estimator, uh, which would suggest that there's no motivation really for the median aside from supposed simplicity. But actually the median shows up as an estimator when your objective is when you have data like this what you want to do is minimize the absolute distances uh, absolute value of the distances from some predictor so suppose you have the following data set we're going to work with the least absolute deviation estimator which is the estimator that minimizes the, ter the term that i've highlighted or underlined in blue um, here is a function that computes uh this uh this uh, absolute value penalty term and uh, I've vectorized it in terms of um, its parameter of mu and then use the curve function which is the R function for uh, plotting curves to plot this function and what you see is that this function actually does take a minimum somewhere it's going to take its minimum here this minimum is at about uh, if we go back to this data set how many observations did it have oh 12.2 so this function is actually minimized at the median of 12.2. Since it's minimized at that median, this would be our estimator for our um, predictor, uh, predicted value mu hat. 
And in fact, if we use the R function optim, which is a numerical optimization function, um, I, I'm, apparently optim is not what you're supposed to use here. There's a different function. Is it optimize? Uh, whatever. But if you ask that function to find when this, uh, when this uh, function is minimized, uh, it actually does minimize it uh, at a value very close to the median. It's not going to get it exactly the median because the median is a point of non-differentiability, but it gets very close to that. And in fact, that is where it's going to be minimized. All right, so that wraps up our discussion for chapter six. Uh, the next chapter is chapter seven, which is going to be on uh, statistical intervals. And statistical intervals include uh, confidence intervals, uh, prediction intervals, tolerance intervals, but for the most part, I would say that most people are familiar uh, with uh, confidence intervals. So we're going to be talking about confidence intervals in chapter seven, and I will see you there.